Hello and welcome to the second game of the model game series. Today we are going to take a look at the game between Haritonov and Rustamov. It was played in Moscow 2006. d4, d5, c4, d takes c4, so Queen's Gambit accepted. Knight to f3. So here the main move is Knight f6, but uh, we can reach the variation which happened in the game by different uh, move orders. So for example, in in this game, Rustamov started with e6, then e3, c5, bishop takes c4, a6. So he was delaying knight f6 a little bit, but uh, not for long. Bishop b3, knight f6, short castle, knight c6, knight c3. And when the bishop comes to e7, normally this is the moment to take on c5 and uh, to enter this endgame variation of the Queen's Gambit accepted, which is uh, recommended in in our course. So let's see how it goes uh, normally. So like knight f6, e3, e6, bishop c4, knight c6, knight c3, e6, bishop b3. In our course it is dc5, but once again it's not... Uh, uh, it will not change the character of the game if we take at this moment or in the next one. So bishop b3, bishop e7, d takes on c5, so winning a tempo. Bishop cannot recapture on c5 right away. But first it moved to e7. So queen takes on d1, rook d1, bishop c5. And of course this... Uh, this endgame at the first moment looks very harmless. Black has no long-term issues at this moment. So pawn structure is completely symmetrical. No visible weaknesses for black. So uh, you could say that it's a very drawish line, but actually white is a little bit ahead on, of development. So we are already castled. We have the rook in the game. And it's also our move at this moment. So with this... Uh, advantage of the development, uh, we can actually gain some long-term advantage in many of the cases, so it's not at all a harmless uh, system by white. So bishop d2, bishop d7, rook a to c1, so it is already eyeing this bishop on, uh, on c5. So the main line is actually bishop a7 in this position. So immediately uh, removing that bishop into a safe square. I looked at another very natural move, uh, which is short castle in this position. Saying that, okay, black is also finishing the development and there are no dangerous knight uh, jumps. So there is one really spectacular move here for white. It is knight to d5. But actually it's more uh, spectacular than good, I have to say. Since, okay, the idea is very clear. So if the bishop moves away now, then we can create a double pawn for black. And after bishop c3, both the d7 bishop and the f6 pawn are hanging. So it's basically already game over. So this is not good. And also in case of knight takes d5, rook takes c5. This is something we are aiming for in this opening to get the pair of bishops. And you know, black's position is really shaky on the dark squares. Unfortunately, though, black has a strong move here, knight to e4. So basically, not only not allowing knight takes f6, doubling the pawns, but also protecting the bishop on c5. And basically, thanks to this move, knight d5 achieves nothing, and black has equality here. So knight d5 is not good. White has to play knight a4. Bishop a7, and it looks like that black is completely fine here, but once again, this one little tempo which, which is missing from black, so if he could just make one more move, it would be indeed completely equal, let's say rook fd8, but as we will see, he is just missing this, uh, this one move. So knight c5, bishop takes c5, rook c5, and again, for a second, it looks like that we achieve everything we wanted, but here comes the, the interesting part, 94. 
So black is attacking the rook on c5 and the bishop on d2, so immediately wants to, to take back uh, the bishop pair. White goes rook c2, knight d2, rook c d2. And here black has actually very, very serious problems. So the bishop uh, cannot be protected, right? Because it's attacked uh, twice with the rooks. So it has to go to e8 or c8. I mean, c8 is not really a human move and it's uh, it's not a good move. So after bishop c8, it's very hard to uh, very hard to suggest for black how to finish development. I mean, white can just play something like rook d6, for example. You know, the, the development of this bishop is, is not going to be uh, an easy thing to solve. So we are following actually an extremely well played game by um, Denis Lazavik against uh, Jeffrey Jong. It was played on chess.com and I'm not sure it was a rapid or bull, uh, blitz, blitz game, but anyway, it's highly impressive, whatever the time control was. So Jeffrey played uh, bishop e8. So just to say the the strengths of the players. So white player is 2440 and Jeffrey Jong was uh, rated 27 over 2700 at the moment of this of this game. So again, white's advantage looks uh, minimal but very unpleasant still. Bishop c2 was played. So the bishop is not doing that much in this diagonal. White wants to relocate it to e4 and then put pressure on the knight and also on the b7 pawn. Black played f6, bishop e4, king f7. So basically white improved his pieces to the maximum and then plays g4, which is again a very very nice move. He wants to gain some space on the on the king side, while you know if the king goes uh, even further, then it will be suddenly the moment that he, uh, he has to watch out for such moves like bishop takes on h7. It will be not so easy to trap that bishop anymore if the king is not there. So that's why g4 is also nice. That uh, So for example, in such case when the bishop takes, f5 will be not so easy because we can just capture that pawn and uh, it will be a rather a target for the bishop. So black played h6, knight d4, rook b8, knight b3, yeah, basically a perfect game from right. Trading on c6 would also give of course some advantage because of the better structure, but this is just uh, even stronger. King e7, knight c5. Now with ideas of uh, entering uh, on d7 with the knight. So black played f5, gf, ef. And bishop takes c6. A surprising but very strong move. So the point is that after bishop c6 there is this super unpleasant knight d7. Forking the rooks. Of course if black uh, takes then the rook is entering with a check. And if black doesn't want to lose the, the f6 pawn right away he has to go to, to f6. And I suppose after rook d6 king e5. We just probably play f4. King e4 and let's say king f2 and it looks like very hard to await uh, a checkmate in the next move. So black played the bishop f3. Knight takes on f8, bishop d1 and then knight g6. So this intermediate check was also important. And here black played losing move king f6. But king f7, I, I believe, also would not have saved the game after knight e5. King e6, now knight e7, again, very important uh, intermediate move. Rook d8, knight c5, king e7, and after trading the rooks, knight b7 check. Uh, white keeps his extra pawn with excellent winning chances. So instead, Jeffrey went king f6, but here that was rook d6 check. King g5, and basically the thing is that we can take this bishop for free if our knight is not hanging. And he made sure with h4, king h5, knight f4, that it's not hanging and just won the piece like this. Once again, a super impressive game regarding that it was played in a in a shorter time control. So basically it's a model game in a model game type of thing. I just wanted to show this game. I, it was very impressive for me. So that's why castling short here is not that easy because then... Uh, 
the king's uh, role of protecting this bishop is actually really hurts black that the king is not there. So bishop a7, knight a4. So our right idea is to play knight c5 and uh, get the pair of bishops, king e7. And here, very important move. And we have to find these uh, subtle moves in this uh, in this variation in order to have chances for the advantage. So the most logical uh, looking move, knight c5, would be a serious mistake. Black simply takes rook c5 and knight e4. So the same idea as we have seen in the previous line, the difference being that the king is in the center. So after rook c2, knight d2, rook takes d2, the bishop doesn't have to move, but the rook simply comes to d8. The bishop goes back to e8 and the game is just equal. So it will be just a draw. So that's why this important uh, nuance here is to play bishop e1 first. So the idea is that when we play knight c5 and then trade rook c5, knight e4 will not attack both the bishop and the rook. And keeping this e1 bishop, I mean, not it's not only that we are keeping the pair of bishops, it can sometimes give very unpleasant checks to this king from that diagonal. So basically this knight on c6 is almost pinned there. So not only it's blocking the c file, but also blocking the bishop. So here black has a couple of options. And okay, in our game, uh, black played the, I would say, very ugly looking move, but it makes sense. And it has a very nice reputation. So let's see some other options. Let's see what happens if black goes for this knight e4. It's now not coming with the tempo and it's not clear where the knight is going, to be honest. So the problem is that white simply plays bishop c2. Okay, if the knight goes back to f6, then it didn't achieve much. And if it goes to d6, it somehow feels very loose. So knight c5 uh, could be a question. That what if uh, black is just trading that knight, and after knight c5, bishop c5. Again, if nothing is happening, black is uh, in time to play two more moves, like bishop b6 or rook d8. The position is just completely equal. But again, just by one move, uh, black has issues here. So we have bishop takes h7. So in case of rook takes, then of course uh, we just take the bishop with an extra pawn. And in case of bishop e3, fe, rook h7, again it looks like that black is completely fine, but unfortunately there is knight g5 attacking the rook here and attacking the attacking the pawn on f7, so the king will be overloaded in case of knight, uh, rook h5, there is simply knight f7, white is winning a pawn, king takes rook d7, is game over basically. So that's the issue with knight e4. Probably the best move in the position is, is rook hd8, which was played for example by, uh, by Nakamura, but it also gives up the pair of bishops, so white plays uh, knight c5. Black probably has to take, that's the best. He can go back to c8, but rook d8, knight d8 is very passive and allows bishop b4, for example. And after king d8, knight a6, typical idea to take on a6 because of the hanging knight on c6. And after bishop e3, fe, rook a6, let's say bishop c3. Again, this endgame uh, with the pair of bishops is pretty unpleasant for black. White has the opportunity to push on the queen side, the majority, and also the bishops can put pressure on the uh, king side. So probably bishop c5 is the best, and then bishop e8, rook dc1. White has again a pleasant advantage. Pair of bishops, basically that black doesn't really have a not only active counterplay, but a, a straightforward plan to equalize. As long as we have the pair of bishops, you know, always this bishop b4 in the air. Sometimes playing knight d4 and try to trade this knight to prepare the square for the bishop. Or just slowly improving with the king. So, yeah, not really pleasant for black. But this is the best. So in this game, black completely wanted to avoid these unpleasant positions. And that's therefore played b6. I mean, the move looks very ugly. This bishop is not so happy about this move, but... Of course, it completely prevents knight c5. So, so white cannot uh, 
take the bishop pair in that way. And basically black's idea is to bring the rook, let's say, to c8. And then at some moment, probably play knight d8 and just try to trade pieces, rooks on the c file, and say that, okay, I mean, it's, it's ugly for the moment, but later probably b5 will come at some moment when there are no rooks and it will be just completely equal. So this position was played in a in a few games and actually I believe in all of them white found a very nice uh, way here. First it was uh, played, this position uh, happened in a game of Karpov against uh, Gulko. So if you want, uh, maybe you can pause the video and look for a good solution for, for white. It's really, really very nice. So rook takes d7. is very, very strong. So knight cannot take back because uh, other piece is falling. So king has to take. And now knight b6. So basically white is sacrificing a full rook for a very dangerous and unpleasant pin. Bishop takes on b6 and bishop a4. So, black is up a rook for only one pawn, but of course on c6 uh, we will take back material. It's bishop c6 is unpleasant, rook c6 is unpleasant, and on the top of it there is also knight e5 coming. So, black is really in a, in a difficult situation here. If the king goes to e7, then rook is coming to c6 and bishop b4 next. The game is probably going to finish very soon. So king c8, king has to rather go into that direction. And now knight e5, so even increasing the pressure and keeping all the options, bishop c6, rook c6, knight c6. Uh, you know, it, it's horribly difficult to prepare against all of those. So black plays king b8. And now in this uh, model game, which I'm going to show you, white played rook c6. Probably, objectively speaking, knight takes c6 is the is the best move, but it's absolutely not easy to see why. And rook c6 keeps a, a safe advantage for white. So let's see why knight takes on c6 is the best. So now black plays king b7, and here uh, both Karpov and another game in a, in a Chinese league went with uh, knight to e5. And that's actually not not really enough to, to have a big advantage. So black plays rook c8, bishop c6, king a7, knight f7, rook f8, knight e5. And here in Karpov's game it was uh, it was knight e5, I believe, and the other move is to is to play rook fd8, and this is not uh, I mean, not not an easy position for for white to convert. So we have a we are pinned on the c file, and knight d5 is coming next, or knight d7 even. So yeah, it's in balance according to the computer. So not this knight e5 is the strongest move here, but the very very spectacular knight e7. So it looks like that we are putting this knight in a very strange place but it is controlling very important squares and cannot really be harassed at this moment. So we have now the big idea of bishop c6 obviously to win, uh, to win the rook. So black plays, I mean black can play king a7 first or after the check so it doesn't really matter, it just move order difference, king a7, bishop c6 and here we can see this uh, strange uh, role of the knight on e7 that if the rook uh, comes to first of all it cannot come to c8 that's a huge thing so our rook cannot be pinned and if it goes to b8 or to d8 let's say it goes to d8 then we just uh, remove the bishop to f3 and knight c6 is an unstoppable threat with some very nasty uh, discover check in the next move so basically this is immediately game over and also g8 square is not available. So f8 is the only one which is available. So here if you play bishop f3 it already gives some advantage but after knight d5 it's not at all clear that it's so easy to convert. 
softer traits, the rook eventually will come to c8 or d8, and it's not, not so easy. So white plays again a very, very strong move, bishop c3. So kind of uh, trying to stalemate black, because if now the knight moves, then the g7 pawn is hanging. And basically black is in a huge trouble already. Uh, the best defense is a pretty funny looking move, knight to g8. But for a second it looks like it uh, it actually can be even better for black in, uh, in a way, because of course if we take on g7 after knight takes on e7, we are down a piece. We can take the rook, but it's uh, one less uh, piece at the end. And if we take on g8, I mean black just uh, takes back, brings the rook to d8, we are down an exchange for only one pawn, and black is better. So of course I... I guess, you know, this is just very hard to foresee that what is the correct move here, but white is winning after this uh, very nice rook d1. So basically rook d7 is the, is the decisive uh, idea. So knight takes on e7, rook d7. If king b8, then we just give a check, king c8, rook e7. The game is pretty much over. We have ideas like playing rook b7, rook b8 mate. And if the rook comes to d8, then it makes it even a little bit faster. Checkmate with bishop b7. So best is to play bishop c7. We take the knight, king b6, bishop e4, and you know this position is a nightmare for black. Still, you know everything is hanging. Bishop d4 check is a threat. Bishop g7 is a threat. Rooks cannot move. Everything is hanging. E5 is relatively the best, and let's say a4, a5, g4. And here I stop my analysis basically with the with the conclusion that black cannot really make moves, so eventually a lot of material is, is going to, to fall. So yeah, pretty spectacular way and absolutely not easy to find in a in a real game, but this is actually the only way to give a, a real advantage for white after 95, it's not so not so easy. So in this game, rook c6 was played by white, king a7, knight takes on f7. So in this way, uh, white is taking two pawns. So despite being down on exchange, we can say that materially speaking, white is doing very, very well. And indeed, it's like, you know, clear advantage. But black can trade the rooks. So rook c8, knight e5, and it's always, you know, with the side who is uh, up on exchange, changing rooks is, uh, trading rooks is very good because then uh, they can use the, the open files much better. So knight e5. Both sides were playing really, really nicely in this game actually. So king b7, knight e5, rook c8, king up one. So it looks like that black can come to, to c1, but actually after king e2, you know, wherever the rook goes, b1, then just knight d3, a1, then bishop b3, for example. So it's not achieving anything, and it can even uh, help white to, to convert the advantage, because, I mean, sometimes even the rook can be trapped in the corner. So it doesn't make any sense, and that's therefore black played bishop c7, which is a very good move, knight d3, and d5, which is also a very good move. So... If uh, black is just waiting for white to consolidate, like with moves like king e2, bishop c3, bishop b3, then this pawn will be just a weakness, this pawn also will be just a weakness, so he will lose, he has to go for active play, and he, he does that. Bishop h2 would be a little bit too active, because after g3 and, uh, and king g2, this bishop is, uh, is simply trapped. So e5 was played, uh, bishop c3, and again, uh, really nice play. So e4, for example, would be a, a mistake because the pawn would just fall on e4 very, very quickly, or not quickly, but you know it, it would definitely be just a, a problem for black. So he rather goes for activating the pieces. Very nice move, knight e4. So after bishop e5, takes takes. White already has three pawns for the exchange for the exchange, which is like quite a big material advantage, but on the other hand, uh, black managed to to activate his pieces. So rook c1 check, king e2, knight c5, bishop d1, 
rook a1, a3, king b6. So still black is not taking anything, just, just he's active and, you know, we have to worry about our queen side, bishop c2. Rook a2, and now nice move king d2, so the king is just in time because of the tactical trick of rook b2. And knight c4 check. So king b5, king c3, knight a4 check. So now we have to take, otherwise b1 is lost. Takes, takes, and this is still an interesting endgame, and computer is actually not, uh, not sure that it is winning for white at all. Which is kind of surprising to me, to be honest, because, I mean, three pawns and a knight for a rook should be, like, on paper it should be a winning advantage, but once again, black's uh, pieces are pretty active. So the game went like h4, rook a1, knight d3, king b5, g3. So white is just protecting all the pawns before move forward, the a5, e4, king c6, king d4, rook d1, e5. And now pushing forward the pawns, rook h1, g4, rook g1, f3. So yeah, it, it feels like a little bit too much to handle, but king e3, h6 was played, and king e4. And here, unfortunately, my database is saying that this uh, game finished. I, I very much doubt. I mean, maybe mm, by time, uh, black lost it. I mean, according to the computer, now we are really on the verge of, uh, of an objectively winning uh, position for white. But it would have been still uh, uh, good to see how he converted it. Of course, it's rather like an endgame type of uh, thing, but it's definitely not a resignable position for for black. Of course, white will continue pushing the pawns, like king f5, f4, maybe even king g6. So, I mean, uh, it's a very suspicious position, but uh, definitely not a resignable one. In any case, uh, the main thing uh, which I wanted to show is this uh, nuances in this uh, Queen's Gambit accepted endgame variation. So this b6 uh, idea was nicely refuted by this rook takes d7. But again, it's rather the idea. So for example, if you play the course, uh, you will not get precisely into this position, but the ideas are of course very similar. So for example, uh, when uh, when such position arises, then we it's very good to know that okay, it's not in our interest to allow this knight c5 takes and knight e4 and getting the pair of bishops and uh, you know just just to know this uh, these ideas. Okay, so I hope you uh, like the video and just subscribe to the to the channel. Uh, if you if you liked it and i will uh, come uh, soon with new videos